Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. How you guys doing? You enjoying our service? Glad you're here? Well, I'm glad you're here. I've got big news and bigger news, all right? You ready? All right, the big news is that this Saturday, we have the Walk for Life uh, for Heartbeat Hope Medical, and that's downtown Fremont at their new location, which is right across the theater, uh, from the theater down there, and so we're going to be running down there. 5K, it's a run-walk kind of a deal, so I'll be there. If you're a runner, you, you need to register, sign up, and do that. I'm not a runner, and I'm doing it, so you could smoke me and laugh at me and then point it out next Sunday at church, and it'll be fun. So do that. Let's do that together. Now, the, you ready for the bigger news? Okay, yeah. Tim Wilson wasn't here leading our music today. Did you notice that? Yeah. And then his wife, Alexa, who stands over here, she wasn't here either, right? They had their baby yesterday, and so we have a picture. Let me introduce you to Kanan Watt Wilson, seven pounds, 10 ounces. All right, isn't that great? Uh, right, before, right before I made this announcement last service, I started thinking, why do, we, why do we introduce kids that way? First time they're introducing the world, we're throwing their weight in there, you know? Hey, my name's Kevin, and I go about a buck 90, and you know... What are we doing there? You know, just kind of odd. You know, you know the birthing room, it's kind of hectic in there. Hey, hurry, whoa, whoa, a baby has emerged from the womb. Hey, cut the cord, get this baby over on a scale. How's that, how much does this thing weigh? You know, what's that all about? But then I figured it out. You know, the men, they don't think about this. Yeah, wait, uh, yeah, we had our baby. Yeah, what's weight? Uh, uh, I don't know. You know, I have no idea. But the women, they're into this because they've had babies. So they're going, oh, a baby, oh, 7'10", yeah, okay, yeah, I can handle that. Oh, 13, 9, oh, whoa, I'll be praying for you. You know, that, that's what's going on there. So it's kind of a gender-specific kind of thing there, just to let you know. But anyway, we are, we're moving on. We have a new series starting this Sunday, Winning the Battle for Your Mind. We're going to shake the rafters like Kim was just singing about, Winning the battle for your mind. And I got to tell you, one of the, the reasons that I'm excited about this series is that I've counseled people for decades. And, uh, at, you know, I, I've been well, 30, over 30 years, been counseling with people. Did that in graduate school and here. And, um, and I have a master's degree in, in counseling, which don't be impressed by that because all the counseling I do, the best kind of counseling is straight from the Bible. It's just do what the Bible says to do. So it's just as simple as that. And what I've noticed is to me, that is amazingly simple. Now, doing it is not so simple, but what we ought to do is amazingly simple. We just find it in the Word of God and do that. Usually, it's pretty easy. Sometimes applying that is a little tougher, but at least if we know what we're trying to do, then we just work on that. But what I've noticed over the years, if I can be frank with you, it's this. Increasingly, people don't really want to take personal responsibility for their issues. And so more and more, there's this attitude that comes into counseling that, that's just like this. And of course, by the way, the world would just they will promote that attitude. As believers, we don't do that, but people come in to counseling and their thing is like, well, that's just the way I am. 
so it must be okay. That's just the way I wired up. That's just who I am. That's just how I, I do things. So that can't be wrong. That's got to be okay. It's the way God made me, you know, or I've been, sometimes you'll hear I've been diagnosed or I have this chemical imbalance, you know, so that's just the way I am. So it can't be wrong. I got to be true to who I am. But that, that's not good thinking. That's buying in to what the culture is teaching us. So today, I, I so, sort of want to approach this topic that I've talked on a few times in a completely different way. And I want to kind of do it from, uh, start off just by illustrating with a psychology kind of an angle. So uh, we, we know from science today that neuroscience tells us that there are 86 to 100 billion neurons in our brain. And neurons are just brain cells that send and receive information. Each neuron, and there's at least about 86 billion of these, each neuron has t around 10,000 connections to other neurons. So if you're keeping track of that, that's 860 trillion connections. And these connections are sort of like pathways. And so you have 860 trillion pathways, and then these pathways will also produce some chemicals, and some of those we like, and, and determine sort of what chemicals are released in the brain. Now, here's the cool thing. God has made our brains to have the ability to change these pathways, to change how our neurons connect with each other. And what that does is it changes, it, we can, we have the ability to change not just our thinking, but change the way that we think. The brain has, our brain has the ability to reorganize itself, rewire itself by creating new pathways, neuron to neuron. And, and, and so we can change. Now, it used to be that scientists thought that that ability to change those pathways, which is called neuroplasticity, was mainly only in children, but not in adults. But now they've proven in the last couple of decades that, that it's actually true that adults has this same neuroplasticity or enough neuroplasticity in order to change in the same way. And so we always used to think, no, only kids do this because kids change so much. They change their thinking. You know, have you changed your thinking since you were a kid? Like, when, there was a time when I was a kid, when, first of all, when I was a kid, we had a TV with four channels and no remote. And so there was a time when I was a kid that I thought my dad only had children so somebody could get up and flip the channel and bring him a beer. You know, that's just what I thought kids, you know, I thought that's what he thought kids were for. But then I don't think that anymore. Well, partly because I had my own children and realized it's a lot harder to raise children than walk across the room and flip a channel. But you get that. So that's not it. I know that's not right now. I grew up. But now, and they used to think that that's the only people that could change or the way they think, the how they think is children. But now they know adults can do this too. We can change the way we think. That's the short of it. And if we change the way we think, it then changes the way we act, behave, and live. By the way, this is what the Bible has told us. The New Testament has told us for 2,000 years. Once again, finally, science has caught up with what the Bible has always told us. And so there's a branch of psychology called cognitive behavioral psychology that's all about changing our thinking. They recognize that most negative behaviors or behavioral issues are associated with bad thinking or a wrong thought process. And so this cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT for short, would, as applied, uh, can help us. Now, the world applies it, they would say it's more about the utility of what you think. 
the, when Christians apply this, they're realizing, no, it's about the truth of what you think, and that's a little different. The world would say, well, you just need to think this, whatever this is, because it'll, be, it'll help you do better in what you're trying to do. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity says, you need to think this because God says this is true, and that will help you live your life. So there is a difference there. And, and it's kind of interesting because when you just look at the whole thing of psychology, most behavioral issues, most issues that people struggle with psychologically, they all go into a pile of what the Bible would call sin. You know, the Bible's didn't teach us how to deal with this for a long time. Nobody goes to therapy because they're just too joyful. That's nah, not working out. I'm too happy. You know, I'm too generous. You know, that's not the way it goes. But the Bible is giving us instruction on that. So, Cognitive behavioral therapy says you can change your life by what you think and how you think. And the problem is, when we have issues, is that we've allowed ourselves to sort of default into a pattern of thinking that we have had before. And let me illustrate that. So, how many of you have dogs? You know, dogs are reliable. You can use them for an illustration, not cats. So, do if you have a dog... <laughs> And, and here's the thing about Ohio is we have these lush lawns, right? How many of you noticed that you'll let your dog out in the backyard and a lot of times your dog will take the exact same path through the yard? Which is just weird because it's a nice lush lawn, but the dog will take the exact same path and he'll, the dog will take that path so much that it will actually wear a path into your yard. Anybody notice that? That's kind of what this is. We have these neurological pathways, and because we've used them before, and sometimes they produce chemicals, some of those chemicals we like, like dopamine, and we've used those before, and then we sort of default into the same pattern of thinking later because it's sort of the path of least resistance. And, and this could be bad because it's hard have you ever tried to get your dog not to go on that path so you don't have a path through your yard? My son had a couple of dogs, and, and he, that was really bugging him because he likes a nice lawn. So he actually got stakes and drove those into the ground like every 10 feet along this path. And he said, so they would just kind of stay on the path and go around the stake. But you're wondering, why? This is a, you got a nice, beautiful lawn Nice grass, why walk on the dirt of this path? But then every once in a while they'd get in a hurry and bong, they'd run right into the stake. That's how powerful these paths are, this way of thinking that we have. We tend to follow default to the neurological pathway that we've done before. And that's what neuroscience is telling us happens with problematic behavior. We've thought about something wrongly, we've created this path, our brain defaults to it, Maybe because some chemicals are produced, but here's what, here's what we know. We can change the pathway. We can change the way we think. We can change what path we take and what chemicals it produces. Winning the battle really is in the mind. And that's what this series is about. But this is what the Bible has told us all along. We didn't have to wait for science. We could have known this 2,000 years ago in the first century just by reading what the apostles wrote. So when it comes to winning the battle of your mind, and the reason I'm doing this is because so many people struggle with things. And so this series, I think, maybe will help you to think about it in a different way about this response of, well, that's just the way I am? Because the Bible's saying you can change that according to the truth of God's word. And here's the first point. We win the battle by renewing our mind. We win the battle by renewing our mind. So once we become believers, we, we've come to understand that God loves us, that we have sinned, we've done wrong, we've alienated ourselves from a holy and righteous God. All of us have done this. But God loves us anyway. 
But because he's holy and righteous, he can't say wrong is right. And not only that, he judges wrong because he is perfectly just. And that's exactly what we would expect from a righteous judge. And that's a problem for all of us because the right consequence of our sin against God is separation from him forever. But because he loves us, he made a way. Jesus Christ came, died, paid our sin penalty if we will only put our trust in Christ and Christ alone for our salvation. When we do that, we realize that we owe God everything. And it should change the way we think. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 12 First two verses, very well-known verses, but I'm going to land on some verses not so well-known, but Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, therefore, he's all the, everything that's preceded that in Romans, a bunch of theology in there, and the therefore of all that truth is that our life would change. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual, or some translations would have reasonable, service of worship. So how do we worship God? By living our lives as a sacrifice to God. Now, when this was written in the first century, everybody knew what a sacrifice looked like. The Jewish people knew what a sacrifice was. Pagans knew what a sacrifice was. Everybody got that. And here Paul's saying, as believers, we live our lives. We worship God by living our lives for him. Verse 2, he says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, please understand, Christianity is not about behavioral modification. Christianity is about living out a transformed life from the inside out, joyfully. So we are to live changed lives, transformed lives, no longer conformed to the world. We're not following the patterns of the world we're living a new, transformed life as we follow God. We are transformed by the renewing. How are we transformed? By the renewing of our mind. By the renewing of our mind. So put it in another way. When we become Christians, it should change our lives. When we become Christians, the way we say it out on the wall there, is if we're truly a believer, we will demonstrate change in our life. That's the normal Christian life. Now, but there's a problem. It's easy to say, hey, how, do you, how are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Okay, the renewing of my mind. So the question is, well, how? How do I renew my mind? That, that's, we all know that verse, or a bunch of us does, but actually, how do you do that? How do we renew our mind? Renew it. First of all, we need to know that renewing our mind is a battle to be won. Renewing our mind is a battle. Now, he writes this in Romans 12. But remember, way before Romans 12, he's given us all kinds of theology. He's told us, hey, we're sinners. We're separated from God. You know, we've got problems uh, in Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But with all that, there's this good news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the free gift of God is eternal life. And then in chapter 6, you know, we're, he, he talks about, hey, you know, and, and he's covered some of this. Hey, before we were Christians, we were dead spiritually. We were dead in our sins, but now we are freed from our sin. We are new people. And he writes it and he goes, hey, we have new life. 
We are new people. The dead is gone. We are, we are raised in him. And he writes that, and no doubt everybody in Rome is going, yeah, Paul, yeah, we're new people. We're new creatures. We got a new life. We're dead to sin now. We're freed from sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe somebody says, hey, yeah, how's that going for you? What? The whole dead to sin thing. Yeah, not so great. Then Paul gets to Romans 7, right? Where he talks about this struggle to live out the Christian life and how hard that is. And that's a, a big old passage. I'll just pull out one verse of that. He says, Romans seven nineteen. Here's Paul in his struggle saying, for the good that I want to do, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. You know, so here's this classic struggle after all that theology saying, but here, here's the truth of the matter. I don't, all this stuff that I want to do as I want to follow Christ, I don't do it. And the things I've decided, I'm never doing that again. I find myself doing it again. It's this struggle. Now later, he kind of wraps that by saying, thanks be to God, we're not under condemnation. And we're thankful for that. But what about the struggle? The struggle is real. What about that? When we become a Christian, here's the deal. When we become a Christian, we are not freed from the struggle against sin. We are freed to struggle against sin. We are freed to struggle. Because before we become a believer, we don't have a chance. What do we have? What resource do we have? But once we become a believer, we can wade into the battle. We can struggle against the sin in our lives. So if there's a battle, a struggle that needs to be won, then the question becomes, okay, so it's a struggle. Question is, how do we win the struggle? Because I've been struggling a long time, and I'm not winning that much. How do we win the struggle? Well, we fight the battle with God's truth, is what Scripture's telling us. We fight the battle with God's truth. That's the answer. It's how we fight. Now, Paul talks about this in his letters, and where I want to go is the letter that he wrote to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we're heading. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, you can turn ahead here. But let me set the context. Paul is writing another letter to the church in Corinth. And this time, he's taking head on some theological lies that have crept into the church. And he's confronting those lies. And as he does that, he's saying, he says a bunch of things that help us personally, that help us with the lies that are in our own mind, because it applies the same way. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and, and why we're having this battle, by the way, is because we're living in the flesh. We're living our lives. We still have our sinful nature with us, and that's the struggle. When we're out of the flesh, when we're in heaven, we're not going to struggle anymore. But we struggle now. Here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 3. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not, and everybody's expecting him to say this, we do not walk according to the flesh. While we walk in the flesh, meaning that we're alive and we have this flesh sin nature to struggle with, we do not walk according to the flesh, meaning we do not walk according to the way the world tells us to walk. We walk in our flesh as human beings, so we have a struggle, but we don't struggle, we don't walk according to the flesh. But he flips a word. He doesn't put walk in there. He says, we do not walk... For though we walk in the flesh, for though we walk in the flesh, we live and breathe and we have sin nature with us, we do not, but he doesn't say walk, he changes the word. He says we do not war according to the flesh. And that, that would make everybody perk up. They're expecting we, we do not walk according to the flesh. Hey, we're in the flesh, but we don't walk according to the flesh. But he says, hey, we're in the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. It's a battle. 
Paul concedes, hey, we all walk in the flesh, but not according to it. But he shifts to, instead of walk, it's war. We don't war according to the flesh. Well, what does that mean? This is a battle in our minds that we fight, but we don't use the normal weapons for war. We use spiritual weapons. It's in our head. And he's saying this applies also to these rivals that are in the church in Corinth, but this is all about the way we think. We're going to see that more and more. So it's a spiritual battle, but it's a war to be fought. And he keeps, Paul keeps using this metaphor. Next verse, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. We get that. But they're spiritual. But divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Okay, that's some pretty strong words there. What's he saying? Well, our weapons, he's talking about our spiritual weapons that are powerful and effective, and they're effective for the destruction of apparently impregnable fortresses. He uses truth. The weapon is truth. Now, interesting when he talks about fortresses, because this word fortresses, in the first century, everybody would know what that meant. In walled cities, you would typically have a tower, a defensive tower, And then if the walls were breached, everybody in town ran to this tower that was stronger than walls. Sometimes the tower was attached to the walls, but a lot of times it was right in the middle of the town. So if if the enemy's coming and the walls are breached, they would run into the tower and they would defend from there. And there's stories, you know, a lot of ancient stories about towers. There's one in the Bible where a lady throws out a rock and kills a guy, you know, and all this stuff. That's all happening. So... That's the imagery, this citadel, a rock fortress in a city. So Paul's saying the fortress is there to protect the lies of the evil one. So remember what John said. We just finished John. There was a point where John recorded for us that Jesus said that Satan is the father of lies. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Lies we would also call, you know, the wisdom of the world. And that not only includes cultural lies that are all around us, but it also includes lies that we've told ourselves. But the weapon of truth brings these fortresses down. Paul continues, verse 5. So how, how is truth overcoming this fortress that's inside of it is protecting these lies? Verse 5, we are destroying speculations, these are thoughts, speculations, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. These are all lies. We are destroying the lies, the speculations, and every lofty thing raised up against what? The knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So first of all, you have to know that Paul clearly sees a battle in the mind. And and he sees it as a spiritual battleground. And here's the imagery he's using. He's saying, in our mind, we have these lies. And we've, we've built, or culture has built, a fortress around those lies. But we use God's truth from his word... On the offensive, we go in, we tear down those walls, we grab the lies, we take them captive and make them submit to Christ. That's what we're doing in our head. We're tearing down the walls, grabbing the lies that we've believed, and we force them captive, we make them submit to Christ, to the word of God. And Paul's saying this, all this is who's on the offensive and who's on the defensive. Hey, we're on the offensive. We're destroying the walls to get the captives. Now, here's how this plays out in our lives. When I was a kid in New Mexico, uh, we had moved to a place. My dad had just retired from the Navy. We were there, and 
we had the opportunity to become a member of a neighborhood pool. We didn't actually have any neighbors around us, but we were in the district that we could have a membership to a pool, which is great in southern New Mexico. You know? So all summer long, like almost every day, me and my brothers, went. we walked to this pool just like a mile away or something. It was great. But while I was there, I had never really learned how to swim. I always wanted to know how to swim because I assumed that I would be in the Navy like my dad. And, you know, if you're going to live your life on the high seas, it's probably good that you know how to swim. But I didn't know how to swim. And so when I went there, you know, I was really tuned in. I want to know how to swim. In this pool, it was a private pool. It's not a public pool. And maybe that's the difference. But it was always weird to me because in this pool, kids dunked other kids all the time. It was allowed. It wasn't even against the rules. You know, the lifeguard was there, and the lifeguard just watched all that, and go get him. You know, it was, you know, but you were underwater for a while, you know, and it was not fun, and you learned how to dunk. You know, you never try to dunk them this way. You always take them to the side because they can't keep that. You know, but anyway, you learned all that. Well, what would happen is there was kind of a bully in the pool a few years older than me who would dunk me. Because of him... I would not go into the deep area because, you know, if he dunked me kind of where I, you know, if it's like four feet deep and I could get my feet down, you know, I could fight my way up to air. You know what I'm talking about? But I thought, you know, if there's nothing under me, I'm in trouble. He won't let me up. You know, I could die. My life is at stake, you know. So, so anyway, so I would be paddling around trying to learn to swim in the deep end and I would see this guy. Well, anytime I saw him in the pool, you know, he would come after me and dunk me. Well, if I was in the deep end, I was afraid, you know, more afraid than normal. So sometimes, like if this is the sides of the pool, you know, if I'm in the middle and he's here, you know, I went that way as fast as I could dog paddling, you know, because I couldn't really swim. And sometimes if I was like here in the pool, you know, not even closer to the bad guy, I would just swim to him. Because I knew if I started swimming across, because I could only dog paddle, you know, he will catch up to me and drown me before I got to the other side. I didn't mind if he dunked me if I could hang on to something because you're underwater and you're hanging, you know, and you can finally work your way, you know, and do that. So it was okay. You had a way. Then I moved away. And then about a year later, I moved back. I, I didn't move back. I came back to visit. Actually, came back to visit on my own. I came back to visit, and my goal was to go to that pool Actually, I just wanted to pound this guy, you know. I had, I, you know, I had a year on me, and I thought, you know, this guy's going down. You know, so anyway, I went to the pool, and the guy was there. And so even though I couldn't really swim all that well, although I had gotten way better at swimming, I just went out into the deep end, and I just waited for the guy. Come on. And that's when it happened. I realized the bully couldn't swim. This whole time, I was swimming toward him to let him dunk me at the edge of the pool. He couldn't swim. I never knew that. So I didn't pound him and it was, everything was good and we got along okay. But this lie that I believed robbed me of the joy of being in the pool for like two or three years. Because this guy, you know, he had come and dunked me. If it was in the shallow end, I didn't really care. But I needed to learn how to swim, and that needed to happen on the deep end, and I couldn't really do that if that guy was there because he would drown me. And then I find that he's a worse swimmer than I am. I just assumed he could swim like everybody else except for me and him then. We do the same thing. We believe a lie. It's not true. But we believe it, and because of that, it robs us of the joy of the life we should be living because we're captured in a lie that's not even reality. And what God is telling us is focus on the truth, believe the truth, and we are freed from that. And the more we concentrate on the truth, that goes away, and we can follow him joyfully. We can change our lives. We don't have to keep believing the lie. And that's what God's truth is all about. We, and, and, and this is offense. The battle's upon us. Don't wait. Dwell on God's truth. 
replace the lies that our culture has told you and maybe that you've told yourself since you were a little kid. Get over that. Move on. Replace those lies with the truth of God's word. We do that by reading his word, hearing his word, thinking about his word, or dwelling on his word, or meditating on his word, like it says in Psalms 1, 1 and 2, where it says this, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Think about God's word, the truth of God's word. And through that, we throw, we pull down these lies and the reasoning in our head that's actually in opposition to God's truth. Now, to some of you, you're going to think, well, this sounds a lot like the power of positive thinking by that Vincent Peale guy. No, that guy was wrong. Power of positive thinking was saying we can think, think, think about something that is going to happen and we can think about it so hard that we can change the external reality. We do not have that ability. What Scripture's telling us to do is replace the lies in our head with the truth of God's word through study and meditation on his word. And when you, when you think about it, meditate on it, dwell on it, it will change the way you're thinking or it will create new pathways for you to think. You'll get off the path that you've been on, the dog path, and you will create a different way. And the more that you do that, the easier it will become to do that. Because you'll create a stronger pathway than you had when you believed the lie. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to anybody else? Okay. We must bring our minds through God's word into harmony with Christ. Doing that affects our thoughts, and then affects our actions and transforms our life. Wrong thinking, we bring our wrong thinking in submission to Christ, and we replace it with better thoughts. Now, Paul talks about this in other places. There's a famous verse, a passage in Philippians 4, 8, and 9. It goes like this. A lot of us have memorized that or tried to memorize it. It says, finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence or if anything worthy of praise, dwell, dwell on these things, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Dwell on it, but then he says, practice these things. Dwell then practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. How many of you have memorized or tried to memorize that verse? Confession time, right? I've tried to memorize this verse, and I'll have it memorized for a little while, and then I forget it. I keep messing up the order of all these things. But let me just say this. Way more important than me remembering the order of these words is that I just remember... Hey, dwell on the things of God. Dwell on what God says is good and true. Yeah, I just need to remember that. I'm not downing memorizing scripture. It's one of the best things you can do. That helps you think about scripture when you're not around it. But I'm just saying, just do. Doing what it says is more important than getting the word order right in our heads. Do it. Think about it. Dwell on it. Meditate on it. So what you think I say all that to say, by the way, this is my introduction. So I'd say all this to say, it matters what you think. What you think matters. The battle's won or lost in the mind. God is giving us truth so we can live it out in transformed lives for him. So in a few weeks, we're going to look at what causes that struggle in us and 
how we can replace the lies that either culture has told us or that we've kind of just told ourselves, maybe for a long time, and replace that with God's truth. And we're going to look at different areas in our life. And so we're going to go through area by area. And so some of you, I know you're sitting here and you're thinking, yeah, I don't really struggle with this. You know, I don't really struggle with anxiety or pride or lust or greed or, you know, or any of these things. I don't, I, don't really, I don't really struggle with that. Well, it could be you don't have enough of God's word that you haven't learned enough about God to even realize the battle is upon you. So come, and we'll explore this together. Let's stand for prayer. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, thanks for loving us. Thanks for giving us truth for a reason. You give us truth so we can take it into our minds and then live it out and transform lives. And God, we pray that you'd help us to do that more and more effectively over the next several weeks as we look at this topic by topic issues that people commonly have because they're not thinking right, because they're not focused on your truth. God, thank you for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.